This is Fresh Air, and I'm Terry Gross. My guest is Michael Bennett, who won a Pulitzer Prize for the Broadway musical A Chorus Line, which he conceived, choreographed, and directed. A Chorus Line is Broadway's longest-running show. It's set in a rehearsal studio where a group of men and women are auditioning for openings in the chorus of a musical. They each have personal reasons for desperately wanting a part. Bennett says A Chorus Line is based on the careers of his friends and on his own experiences. He got his start on Broadway dancing in choruses and then went on to choreograph musicals, including Promises, Promises, Company, and Follies. Bennett was also well acquainted with the subject of his recent hit musical, Dream Girls, which is based on the girl groups of the 1960s. He spent part of the 60s as a dancer choreographer on the TV rock and roll show Hullabaloo, where he worked with the vocal groups that Dream Girls is based on. When I spoke with Michael Bennett, he was working on several new shows, and he had just bought a small Manhattan theater, which he intends to use for workshops of new musicals. Michael Bennett told me that even when he was growing up in Buffalo, New York, he knew he wanted to be a Broadway choreographer. I used to come every summer when I was from 11 on, and I would go see all the Broadway shows, and I knew I wanted to be just like Jerry Robbins. He was my idol then. And that, uh, I mean, I was very unhappy that I... Didn't, wasn't born in New York. It was like a tragedy. I wanted to be born, right, you know, right on 44th Street in Schubert Alley. I think that would have been perfect for me. I know that uh, Jerome Robbins has been a great influence on you, and you really admired his choreography. Mm -hmm. I have only worked with him for two hours, you know, my whole two life. Two hours, is that all? Yes, I, I mean, when I played more. Baby John in West Side Story when I was beginning my career, um, we were going to Europe for a year. And he came in because uh, one of his dance captains had staged the company and everything. And he came in for two hours and rehearsed for two hours. He gave me one note on one step. Make my arms straighter. And did that stay with you for the oh, rest of your life? Yeah, well, I mean, I have done many, many steps where my arms are not always straight, you know. I mean, but for that step, they, yes, they were straight every single performance I did. But he's a remarkable man. Every show that Jerry has done is, you can tell it's a Jerry Robbins show. Unfortunately, you know, now he's retired to the ballet and he doesn't do Broadway anymore. But... King and I is nothing like West Side Story, is nothing like Fiddler on the Roof, uh, is nothing like High Button Sho Shoes, which he did. I mean, and I'm leaving out a gypsy. I mean, the, uh, you, he, he doesn't have a definite style. Like, for instance, Bob Fosse implants a certain specific style on every show. I have tried to do much more like what Jerry does. I mean, I hope you know it's a Michael Bennett show because it's good. <laughs> but every show is different and the styles that I use choreographically or the styles that I use scenically and everything are different, every production. When you first came to New York, what you were doing on Broadway was dancing and choruses. Was that your ambition? Did you know what you wanted to do? Oh, no, that? no. At 11, I wanted to be J just like Jerry Robbins. But, I mean, Jerry Robbins started as a chorus dancer. I mean, all choreographers start in the chorus. You start as a performer. You become an assistant choreographer. Then you become a choreographer. And then, you know... Uh, the director and then producer. I mean, you know, with me, it varies with other people. Most people are satisfied doing one or two things. I happen to be a workaholic and a control freak, so I like to have my hands in everything. <laughs> were you good at auditions when you were starting out? Well, I am not tall. I mean, which comes as a surprise to me because I feel very tall. And then I'll get in a rehearsal room and I'll be, because, you know, I still dance when I choreograph. And, I mean, there'll be, you know, a short boy dancer in the room and I stand next to him and I'm the same size and I'm amazed you know, that I'm not tall, but it's hard. That, that um, limits your, your I mean, it your limits roles? you. Do you know what I mean? You can't have too many short dancers. I guess, you know, women dancers tend to have really long legs and, and mm -hmm. men yeah, are so and I mean, if women. you ha have to partner girls and a choreographer does lifts and things, you've got... But I luckily was a good dancer, so I worked quite a bit. But I did retire as a dancer at 21 was the last time young. that I performed. Well, by then I was choreographing. Do you tap? Oh, sure. I started as a tap dancer, and then I studied... Uh, Oh, Spanish dancing, modern dancing, ballet dancing, acrobatics. Oh, you know what's very interesting now? The Olympics have done so much because now dancers all study gymnastics. So, I mean, now not only do boy dancers leap around the stage and carry on, but they fly through the air and do double back somersaults and things like that, and that's fabulous. I mean, the, America, the, dance, the caliber of dancers in America right now is wonderful. And I really think a lot of that has to do with Chorus Line because I am now auditioning dancers who started dancing because they saw a Chorus Line. How did Chorus Line come about? Oh, it was an idea I had in my head for a couple of years before I did it. 
I mean, it's it's a lot about my life. It's not a, really about my life so much in the Zach character as people think, and I'm not like the Zach character. That's the director He's of the, the Zach character. He's the protagonist of uh-huh. the play, and it's to make the play. I'm much more Mike and Mark and other characters in the piece. Um, Don, things like that. But uh, Broadway was in trouble, sort of like it is now. And uh, I had this crazy idea that that I didn't think anyone would understand, basically. So I went to Joe Papp was the you know New York Shakespeare Festival and I said I have an idea would you let me work on it for a while like like um, in a workshop thing and see if I can uh, make a play and it was started out to be a play with music and then of course became a musical because I always start everything to be a play with music then they all end up musicals um, and I got Marvin Hamlish to do the score and we had been working together for years he was my dance arranger when I first started choreographing I mean I was 20 he was 19 something like that and he had just won three Academy Awards that year for this thing and the way we were and all that. And he agreed to do it. And Ed Cleveland was the lyricist. And we just worked on it for a year. And I hired a cast. And we wrote for the cast. And, I mean, I had a beginning, a middle, and an end and a point of view about what I was doing. The truth is, actually, Chorus Line came out of the Watergate hearings. <laughs> I mean, because I, it was an idea that I had. And what activated me to do the show was I sat for that summer. Remember that famous summer? And I watched those hearings. And I thought... God, I, we don't have heroes anymore. It's very hard for us now because the country went through quite an emotional crisis. We couldn't trust our, our leaders. And I went, but wait, the American people are still great. And I mean, Chorus Line says that in a way. It says we collectively are wonderful. I, be- I believe that to this day, you know. Were the stories in a Chorus Line based on stories of friends of yours? Yes. I mean, mixed up. Like one character's made up out of half of this girl's life and half of that girl's life and some funny lines. Did you get any of those friends to actually play the roles? Yes, yeah, some of them did. Some of them didn't. I always think that um, auditions for you must be really hard now because you've, you've written the musical about how people, how their personality and identity isn't always revealed during that first audition and they have so much on the line. And they really are individuals. They're not just faceless chorus line dancers. And there you are judging you know, thousands well, of I mean, people. Well, I mean, chorus line by. goes a little deeper than I normally do at auditions. But it is very important to talk to people in an audition. I mean, first of all, for a dancer, in case you have to have a dancer play a part or something, if you give him a script to read, he's going to read unless he's had a lot of acting training. But if he's got the right personality for the role, you're going to be all right. You just rehearse him. Give him time. And, but also it's about the chemistry of a cast. I mean, there are, there are people who are neur- neurotic and talented, and there are people, at the, and it's worth putting up th- with the neurosis, uh, but there are people that are destructively neurotic in terms of a whole company. And you must get a chemistry of a company not only to be able to do the show and do it brilliantly eight times a week, but to be able to get along. What's a way that so I mean you yeah. must find out. Are you, I mean, and I'm on the line creatively when I'm doing a new show, and I'm in a room with a hundred people. I mean, you know, a writer can sit with a typewriter, and there's nobody over his shoulder. When I'm creating, it's in front of a lot of people, and so there can be personalities that are just too judgmental, and I mean, I sense something in their eyes, and it's not helpful, and so. It's, it's very important to me that the personalities, the same way I try and be very supportive to my actors and uh, my whole production staff and everything. I mean, I believe if somebody's in a room working for me, it's because I know they're talented, and they don't have to prove that they're talented every second. I can't figure, though, how you But I don't want to have to prove that I'm talented every second either to them. Mm-hmm. I want the work to just flow, and it usually does. How can you tell in the short time that you have in those initial auditions if someone's going to be destructive? I always erotic? audition people three times before I hire them. What do you ask for in a typical audition? Well, I, if, if, it's, uh, if I'm starting with dancers, I ask for a double pirouette and a time step. And you can tell if people have had any training. And that's all you need to see. And that first, and I eliminate down. Then I actually teach combinations and dance styles and find out. Then you know exactly how much training they've had. And then you ask them about it. Then you talk to them. Then they sing. Then they read. And there's three, uh, three t- I never hire anyone I don't see three times. Because somebody can be wonderful in the first audition. And then something happens in the second. Or they're great three auditions and you're just, you know, you're thrilled and you write the part and you make it bigger. In those initial auditions, are they performing in a large group? Um, 
sometimes. Well, we have what we call cattle calls, you know, where 300, 400, 1,000, 2,000 people show up. So that's why you do pirouette and time step or the last 16 bars of a song, because you can tell someone has rhythm pitch, uh, has a theater voice. Why the last 16 and not the first 16? Because the last 16 are where all the high notes are and it's the big <laughs> ending. I mean, why start with, you know, <laughs> kiss today, goodbye? Who needs to hear those 16 bars? <laughs> Let me hear the big ending. I mean, you want to hear, you know? Makes sense. Do you tell them what to sing or do they choose anything? No, they song? can choose anything that they're comfortable with as long as they know that they're going to sing the last 16 bars. Then if you love the way they sing, then they sing eight songs for you. What are the most popular songs for auditions now? Well, it changes every year. I mean, I remember when I was doing Promises, Promises, which was back in 1968, everybody was singing, and I think I'm going out of my head. You remember that one? Yep. And that was very big for a while. Memory was big for a while recently. Um, I, ask, I ask people not to sing songs from my shows. That it's, I mean, I think it's a foolish thing to do in an audition because I'm used to hearing it a certain way and, and also I've heard them and heard them and heard them. So I ask people to sing other things and then, I, and then I have them sing songs from the score if I'm interested in them for roles. Do you think it's a good idea for someone to uh, perform something pretty esoteric, a, a composer's no. trunk song or something which you wouldn't already know? No. You know, if it was Jacques Brel, I was staging. You could come in and do some great, intense aria. Do you know? But if if it's Dream Girls, come and sing. You know, a, a real Motown hit or something. Or uh, you know, pick pick. The, if it's a if it's a Broadway show like Sweet Charity, come in and do, uh, Hey, Look Me Over, another Cy Coleman song or something. You know. What do you tell someone? Do you use that line, "Don't call us, we'll call you"? If oh, if they're not going to make it. Oh no. What do you say? No, I mean, first of all, you work with the casting director who sets up all the auditions. Are you thinking of auditioning or going into the theater? No. <laughs> <laughs> all these questions. No. Um, I, bet, I bet it's your, really ni your, your nightmare first, that, that an interviewer has asked you here to really see if they can get a part in one of your productions, right? No, I expect you to slip me a cassette of your kids' <laughs> rock and roll music that you're going to see if I can get to David Geffen or something when it's over. <laughs> um, what did you ask me? Oh, if, if you ever use that line, don't call us, we'll call you. Oh, no, that's so corny. That's like, show us your legs. Uh -huh. I mean, believe me, there aren't casting couches and things like that. That's all myth. I mean, maybe there are. Maybe, maybe in Hollywood, but not <laughs> in New York. Are, are there ways that... I'm very us? nice in auditions, especially to counteract the image of being Zach. I am really nice, and it's very, very hard for them. It's also very hard for us auditioning, because you see, you know, you spend four hours looking at people and smiling, and your face hurts from smiling, but you have to be supportive and helpful. Auditioning is very hard, but it's necessary. Do uh, performers ever really pursue you? Call no. Call you every day? No. Well, I don't know. I have two secretaries. It's right, so you wouldn't, you'd be protected me. from that. Were you I mean, performers that I work with can always get to me, mm -hmm. or who are working for me, or have worked for me, because I get very close to my kids. I shouldn't say kids, but... W were you surprised uh, at, a, at a chorus line success? Sure. Thrilled, ecstatic. Nothing had ever happened like that before in the theater. It's the longest running show in history. And it's mine. It's amazing. And it's the story of my life on top of it. It's amazing. After a chorus line, I'm sure everybody was watching to see what your next big Broadway musical was going to be. And it was something called Queen of the Stardust Ballroom, which I think was only on for about three months or so. Mm -hmm. It was a big bomb. Did that... Uh... The New York Times critic last line of the review, I only remember my bad reviews, <laughs> was uh, ultimately we are all Mr. Bennett's victims. Now, this is very interesting. Ballroom was this sweet show about old people who went to a ballroom and I, I got all of these dancers who were like over 50 who hadn't danced in years and we spent six months getting back in shape and they danced beautifully and it was like the Enchanted Cottage and it was very sweet the show. And what I think the, the critics and everyone expected was me to go wham again like I did with the chorus line. And I wanted to, first of all, I love the property because I believe that love makes everybody beautiful. And it's like, for instance, my father died a year and a half ago and now my mother is living in Florida. I hope my mother remarries. She's, you know, in her early 60s. Uh, I hope she meets a man who thinks she's just beautiful. And I mean, that's what the play was about. And, you know, they expected something else. Now, I think it was very helpful because that ended that. I mean, any show I do is different than the last show. Now, I mean, I, ha I am going to do another show that's similar to A Chorus Line. That's like, it's not a sequel because it's not about the Chorus Line characters, but it's about the next period in my life. 
and what happened. And it's about success and failure, but it's not about from my point of view. Because, it, I mean, if I told you it was lonely at the top, you'd go, oh, you on. You know? And by the way, it isn't lonely at the top. It is not lonely it's, at the No, top. it's not. It's crowded is the truth <laughs> of it. And, uh, I mean, success is hard to deal with. But it, it's harder. It was very, very hard on my family. The and success? the people around me, the success, yes. Well, people get afraid of losing you. Because of all the competition for your time and, yes, and emotion? Yes, yes. Well, I was running around the country. I mean, I had five companies, of course, line going at one time. And I was, you know, I was on a plane for five years. And then I had a little nervous breakdown and decided it was time to let other people take care of Chorus Line for a while because I couldn't direct one more Sheila scene. Is it easy to let See, it, yeah. it's wonderful to create. And when you just recreate and recreate and recreate, it becomes such deja vu. And then, of course, you're on planes with nothing to do, so you start drinking. And I mean, oh, here we go, another city. Watch the show, take notes, give notes, fix the company, watch the show, see if they took the notes, go, next opening, do press. Uh, I mean, it was... Um, I, and I didn't have time to do new things. That's why I didn't do the Chorus Line movie. That's something I did 11 years ago and worked on for years. I just let someone else do it. I mounted new things. I mean, an artist must stay fresh. You must keep that mechanism going every day and creating, or you can be in terrible trouble. Did you ever start to feel like your life was developing into a, a B-movie? Oh, my life has always been a B-movie. I like B-movies. I mean, uh, the serious answer to that question was my life developing into a B-movie. No, but I, you know what happened to me? I became like a cartoon comic strip character in all the gossip columns. That's interesting when you read stuff about yourself in the papers. And it's not true. And they've just created you as somebody and they keep you going as a running <laughs> character. I mean, it's very interesting. Because I have no press agent. And I get tons of press. It amazes me. When um, Ballroom closed after uh, a couple of months or so... I went to China. Were you really depressed by it? Uh, yeah. I mean, I was hurt. I mean, in a sense. I thought that... Uh, the reviews were, I mean, I didn't, I, I, I really liked the show, so I was depressed. But I got over it. <laughs> I went to China and did a ballet for the Peking Ballet Company. That must have been fun. Yes, it was fun. I mean, dancers are wonderful all over the world. You look in a mirror and you figure, I learned how to say five, six, seven, eight in Chinese, and we were fine. And off we went. <laughs> how did you become involved in Dream Girls? In Dream Girls, Tom Iron and Henry Krieger, who were the writers, brought the idea to me. How did they pitch it to you? What did they tell you they about They brought 16 songs and an outline for a story, and I put them into workshop. You see, I have a process which is called the workshop process, which is the way I did Chorus Line. And it's four six-week rehearsal periods, and you try out parts of the show. And you fix a show and shape a show around the performers, and without the pressure of being in a hotel room in Boston and a deadline and being in previews. And when you're satisfied with what's in the room, then you raise the $6 million and you go out and you do the musical. Now... By the way, I mean, the economics of the theater are so difficult that the smartest way to do musicals is like I did Chorus Line originally at the Newman in a 299-seat theater because you can cut your costs enormously. And a lot more musicals that could never get on will be able to get on. Let's go back to talking about Dreamgirls. Um, everyone describes Dreamgirls as being patterned on the story of the Supremes. How literally is it really uh, oh, no. patterned on them? Well, the Supremes were, of course, the most successful of the girl groups. Um, there were many, many girl groups. There were many cast changes in those girl groups. Um, I knew the Supremes very well because I was a dancer on Hullabaloo and assistant choreographer, and they used to do the show every two weeks. And you remember that famous Philharmonic concert, that Joe Yulo poster, the Supremes at Philharmonic Hall? That was really when they sort of really burst through. Well, that was just another gig for them. They arrived with the plastic bags with the dresses in it and their wig cases and their... Uh, uh, make a box, and uh, Jamie Rogers, who was the choreographer of Hello Blue, and I were very close with them. We were backstage, and there was no one from Motown there, and there was their driver and uh, one their chaperone, and they were doing an interview, and and I mean that's why the Dream Girls scenery, like all the dressing rooms, are just so simple, because I mean they just moved from place to place, and Florence was a wonderful girl, you know, and Florence died at 32, and. Uh, but Florence fell in love with someone. This is Florence Ballard you're talking about? Yes, I'm talking about the real Supreme story. You know, Florence fell in love with someone and wanted children and, and uh, was not... She wasn't pushed she out? She was not... She, 
No, she was. I don't believe she was pushed out. I mean, but she was not uh, Diana. You know, I mean, talent-wise. I mean, in the show, Dream Girls. I mean, Effie. It's about an R and B singer versus a pop singer. By the way, it's not about a fat girl versus a pretty girl. I mean, you know, Jennifer it was 156 pounds when the show opened. It was about a style of singing versus another style of singing. And I mean, yes, the Dina is prettier and all of that. But it, it is not the story of the Supremes. Now, if it were the story of the Supremes, believe me, I would have been sued. Mm. You can bet on that. You know? And I mean, I, it was, it's not fair of me to tell the story of the Supremes. Now, after all these years, I've gotten so used to this, and I guess it doesn't hurt the show. And you see a lot of people that were not familiar with that particular period in time, of course, see the girls and... Uh, and they go, well, this must be the story. Well, it's not. Diana will write a book, or Barry Gordy will write a book, or I hear Mary, by the way, has written a book that's coming out, and you'll hear the real story. Was it fun being a dancer on Hullabaloo? Was it fun? No, it, it was a concrete floor. It was, it, yes, it was. Of course it was. I mean, because every, every rock act, all the English rock acts, Sonny and Cher, and Stephen Eady and Sammy Davis were the hosts, and the guys from Uncle. I mean, you just got to know everybody. But the, it was a concrete floor, and we used to jump up and down and shake. And it was, you know, when the fru came in and all of that, we used to have such headaches because we'd, you know, for two days we'd be in that studio. After rehearsing for three days, we used to do nine or ten numbers a week. And Hubble, you had to dance in cages sometimes, too, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, oh, God, yeah. But I, but, I mean, I loved it. I just headaches. <laughs> what, what do you think of solid gold choreography? Well, it reminds... I mean, it's... Well, the truth is going to sound arrogant, but, I mean, that style of dancing I did in a show called Promises, Promises in 1968... And it's 1985, and they're still doing all that stuff. I, but I like it very much. I think that she's very, very talented. For the choreographer? But I, yes. But I think that, do you know what I mean? It's, it's, I, I am ready to see something new, too. I think it's really hot. I'm amazed at, you know, I mean, how TV's changed. I remember when Joey Heatherton, on the first show of Hullabaloo, Hullabaloo turned around and shook her ass, excuse me, into the camera, and it was a scandal. I mean, the uproar was crazy. Well, now you see TV ads, and you see, I mean, the dancing, everything. I mean, it is the 80s, and it's just fine, but it's amazing. And, of course, we are now into our bodies. God, we should all be healthy now, like never before. If you um, dance on Hullabaloo so much, I guess you didn't have to watch tapes to see what the girl groups and soul groups were up oh, to no. in terms of their career. No, I had to do no research to do Dream Girls. Right. What's the difference on Broadway between what the director does and what the choreographer does? The work should be seamless. The truth is you should never know who did what. But um, I think director-choreographers are more successful with the, what has happened to the musical. Because the, the musical numbers, I mean, in the old days, you know, Agnes and Bill, there would be a ballet, and that was a big innovation. The ballet had something to do with the show. Because before that, there used to be this play, and then the dancing girls would come out in the middle while they changed sets behind a drop. I mean, now it's all integrated. The dancing tells, a dance number should tell as much about the plot as the next scene, like the next song does. And now I do a great deal of underscoring. I work very cinematically on the stage. I do a great deal of underscoring. I do a lot of sung dialogue. I get into, you know, you don't just hear a bell tone, here comes a song, and then there's a note and it ends. I do transitions. Um, what makes for a good transition? I think one of the... Uh, Seamless. Yeah, because... Uh, uh, Seamless. For in the audience, it seems that that's the difficult and part fast. of getting from the, the dialogue into the number. Remember when you'd see shows and you wait a minute and a half while scenery changed? Mm hmm Until the next scene could go on? I have 28 scenes in Dreamgirls, and, the, and there isn't a set change that's longer than eight seconds. There isn't a costume change that's longer than 11 seconds. Those girls walk on, off in one, and while they're walking around the wing to re-enter in three, their wigs are being changed, their dresses, their shoes, and their jewelry. I mean, it's so much like a movie, you forget it. I mean, the wings are actually as interesting as the show is. But there are 17,000 pieces of costuming in Dreamgirls. My God. It must be a real art to get people changed that quickly. Well, when you coordinate dressers, stagehands, orchestra, lighting cues, spot men, sound men, I mean, it has become, in order to keep up with the times in the 80s, one cannot 
you know, ignore the machinery. And of course, something happened to the theater sound, which was the electrical guitar entered the pit because popular music changed. And once the electrical guitar entered the pit, entered sound and mics, because you had to mic everything else in the pit, and then you had to mic uh, all the artists on the stage. So I mean, all that, all the arguments and the things you read about sound, is sound destroying the theater? No, sound is just a new design form that's going into the theater and is necessary. And orchestrations are fuller and much more like popular music. The old orchestrations used to go, um, chum, chum, um, and Ethel would belt out over the top of it with nothing playing anywhere near her range. Everything, do you know? I mean, it's not like that. Our ears are different. We want to hear a different kind of sound. You've worked with Hal Prince. Yes. I've worked with everybody, which has been wonderful. Do you know? I've worked with Bert Backrack and Hal Prince and Alan J. Lerner and Stephen Sondheim and Richard Rogers. I mean, to name composers. And then Neil Simon. I mean, I've been very, very fortunate, and I've learned from everybody. What did you learn from Hal Prince? What did I learn from Hal Prince? Well, first of all, he taught, he taught me the most important rule of directing is casting is 90% of the work. If you cast right, the rest is easy. I mean, in terms of the acting. Uh, but Hal is a true craftsman. I mean, I had uh, a wonderful time working with him. Have you ever made any big mistakes with casting? Mm-hmm. What do you do? Can you, can you fire, fire them? them? You have to. I mean, it, it's for the good of the whole show. You can't let a show go down for one person. You just can't. It's very hard to do. But you have to. Steal yourself beforehand. Do you mm -hmm. do it yourself? Do you do the firing yourself? I always do it myself. It sounds like that's important to you to do it yourself. Well, it's my mistake. It's not their mistake. If I miscast them, it's my mistake. And a I owe them an apology. A chorus line is still running. Dream Girls closed after I don't know how many thousand Almost performances. Five years, I think. When do you know it's time for something to close? When the people don't come anymore and you don't sell enough tickets to pay the payroll then you know it's time to close. It's economics. It's very simple. That was Broadway choreographer and director Michael Bennett, whose musicals include A Chorus Line and Dream Girls. Fresh Air is a production of WHYY Radio in Philadelphia. The engineers for this edition were Jay Goldman and Ron Barron. Fresh Air is edited by Maeve McGoran. Amy Salad is the associate producer. Danny Miller and I co-produce the show. My name's Terry Gross, and I want to thank you for listening. This edition of Fresh Air is available on cassette. To order a cassette of this interview or for a listing of other Fresh Air programs available on cassette, call toll-free 800-253-0808. In Alaska and Wisconsin, call 608-263-4892. The number again for a cassette of Fresh Air is 800-253-0808. National distribution of fresh air is made possible with the financial support of listeners to WHYY-FM, Philadelphia. Additional funding comes from National Public Radio member stations and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is NPR, National Public Radio.